Hello everyone, um, welcome to this workshop, Introduction to EVENS, um, the Evidence for Equality National Survey. I'm Jen Buckley and I'm from the UK Data Service User Support and Training Team. And I'm really delighted today to be joined by Professor Nisa Finney from the University of St Andrews, who is a Director of EVENS, and also Joseph Harrison and Michaela Strasner from the University of St Andrews, um, who've been working on the EVENS project. Um, we also have Jill in the background today, who's helping to make sure everything goes smoothly. And so here's an overview of the session that we have today. So it's in three parts. The first part, um, Nisa is going to talk us through um, everything around creating the EVENS data. So she's going to be telling us about what was new about EVENS and the motivations for the survey and how they went around recruiting uh, and doing their data collection. We'll then move on to look at um, everything there is about the EVENS data, so the sample, the contents of the topics and the types of variables that we've got. And then moving on to sort of closing up by looking at how you might use EVENS data. So she'll talk through a snapshot of some of the findings and some example research areas. And then I'll talk through how you can go about accessing the data from the UK Data Service. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end, but we invite you to ask your questions throughout the session and people will be answering them um, as we go through. So to answer your questions, we ask you to use the Q&A um, box in Zoom. And these will be picked up as we go through um, in the Q&A box or answered live as we go through. So that's it for the introduction. And I'm going to pass over to Nista. Thanks, Jen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this very first session about this exciting new data set, the Evidence for Equality National Survey. So we'll start off with just the highlights of what is new about EVENS. Um, so EVENS, EVENS is the largest and most comprehensive survey of ethnic and religious minorities in the UK. It has 14,000 participants, including around 10,000 who identify as ethnic minorities. And the data are novel and robust in ways that I'll elaborate as we go through the session. And so it really does provide quite a unique, rich resource for understanding experiences of minoritized ethnic groups in Britain. And importantly, and again, I'll explain a little bit more about this, EVENS uses some quite innovative survey methodology, non-probability methods to improve the representation across a large number of ethnic groups. So to help me and Joe and Michaela as we go through the session, we're now just going to ask you for a little bit about your interests and your experience of survey use before we get underway with telling you a bit more about how we went about collecting EVENS. So if you just type in here using the same Mentimeter tool as you used before, your main research interest, this can just be a, a keyword and we should see those start popping up on, on the screen. And we do have with us today a real range of people in the audience, and that's fantastic to see the appeal of EVENS. So we've got people from local government, from central government, from uh, voluntary sector advocacy organisations, as well as from a large range of academic institutions and a number of disciplines across um, the social sciences and humanities. And I can see from this uh, dynamic word cloud that we've got quite a lot of you interested in health, health inequalities, education, racism, uh, social justice inequalities. And um, so a lot of these topics we will touch on today and certainly you will be able to uh, research using the EVENS data. So health is coming up there as one of the largest words, that means that quite a few of you have put that in there. So as we go through, I'll emphasize some of the qualities of EVENS for those doing health or public health or patient oriented research. <laughs> That's great, thanks very much. Now let's see a little bit about how experienced you are in using survey data. I've never used survey data. I've used it a bit or I use it often. 
and it's part of your day-to-day -day work. Okay, that's that's really helpful, actually. I think most of you have, have responded now. So we've got quite a range, uh, and I'll try to speak to that as we go through. Most of you have some appreciation of survey data, used it a bit, but it's not a central part of what you, what you do perhaps day to day. Some of you are survey experts, um, and I'll point to other ways that those of you who, who are very experienced in survey data might get more information and training on evens. And I'll, I'll try to be very clear so that those of you who don't have understanding about uh, survey data, don't have experience, will still get a good sense of the capabilities of evens. Please do, as Jen says, ask your questions in the Q&A box. Joe and Michaela are on hand to respond to those as we go through. And please ask absolutely anything. Uh, any question is a welcome and and valid one in the session today. So let's move on to hear a bit about why we went about um, undertaking the EVENS survey. So our first motivation for EVENS was the very well-established context of ethnic inequalities in the UK. And this had been revealed by research from the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, as well as many other areas of research across the UK and elsewhere. These very stark and very persistent ethnic inequalities across social realms. And this became emphasised, highlighted, and a more prominent part of political debates during the COVID-19 pandemic, where we saw, particularly in terms of health outcomes in those early phases of the pandem pandemic, very, very stark ethnic inequalities, uh, which are under discussion actually this week in the COVID inquiry. And it had been commented, including by Nasru and Bakaras, that the higher COVID-19 related mortality in places that had high ethnic minority populations were a consequence of social and economic inequalities driven by entrenched structural and institutional racism and racial discrimination. So we were made motivated in producing the AVEN survey by a concern about racism and discrimination and a concern that we couldn't understand this very well with existing data sources. And indeed, there have been debates more generally about data deficiencies around ethnicity. And there's fantastic work going on in, in many research groups and in national statistical offices to try to address this. But it, it came to a head really during the pandemic when we realized we couldn't evidence the kind of things we wanted to understand about the differential experiences. Because social surveys in the UK tend to represent a rather limited number of broad ethnic groups. And the survey sampling favours by design intentionally areas of residential clustering of ethnic minorities, which we could think of as being different characteristically uh, from other parts of the country. Crucially, general surveys don't have questions on the whole that are bespoke to the concerns of experiences of minority groups. So very deliberately and quite rightly, they're designed to capture information about the general population, but this doesn't allow us to know about specific experiences, including racism and discrimination that might um, more prevalently affect minority groups. We have fantastic census and increasingly administrative data with good population coverage across ethnic groups, but that doesn't have good topic coverage. So the, the data on ethnicity is, is patchy, let's say. And then we had this interest in innovative survey methods to try to better represent ethnic groups. And there hasn't been a prior application of this rapidly developing area of survey research, non-probability methodology to numerically small populations in the UK. So this was an opportunity to demonstrate and try this approach to social surveys, which has implications for other kinds of data production as well. We were motivated by knowing more about the patterning and the mechanisms of ethnic inequalities and to address the ethnicity data gap. How did we go about recruiting and collecting the data for EVENS? Well, the questionnaire is quite a long one. It's a 30 minute questionnaire, and this is available in the technical report that Jen will, will point out to you later on, and also on the EVENS website. And crucially, this was developed in collaboration with partners on the project. 
So the content was shaped to some extent by the interests of race equality organisations who we partnered with, which I'll come on to in a moment. The survey was administrative, administered online through an open web link with also a telephone interview option, and it was available in the 14 languages shown here on the slide. And importantly, we didn't have a sampling frame. We didn't invite specific people or households to take part in events. We advertised this widely. We said, if you consider yourself to be an ethnic minority, um, no matter where in Britain that you live or how you identify, come and take part in the survey and tell us about your experiences. So it was open to, to everybody who considered themselves to be an ethnic or religious minority. Residency in Britain was a requirement for eligibility. We issued an in incentive, a £10 voucher on completion of the survey. And data were collected between February and October 2021, so uh, the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the questionnaire itself, which you'll learn a bit more about as we go through some of the examples of what you can do with the data, um, had original questions, but also questions borrowed from or developed from existing well-established social surveys in the UK and elsewhere. We worked in partnership with Ipsos to deliver the, the survey and it was conducted with full ethical approval, including a number of amendments from the University of Manchester. Now, this approach that we talk of non-probability sampling with no sampling frame required us to take a responsive approach to recruitment. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, we set target quotas. We had an, an aim of a certain number of people um, in terms of their ethnicity, age, sex and region of residence in Britain. And this was to start us off as close as possible to a demographically representative sample. There was an initial registration or screen, screening questionnaire as part of the survey, and this ensured eligibility of participants in terms of their residence in Britain and their identification as an ethnic minority. So those whose eligibility was validated were provided with a link to go through to the main questionnaire. So rather than checking who had participated in relation to our sampling frame, for example, our list of addresses who we posted invitations to, we monitored who was responding in terms of the demographics in relation to the target quotas. And we were doing this on a daily basis throughout the field work. And this enabled us to be responsive and adaptive in our pro approach to recruitment. So where we could see that we were below our target on a certain ethnic age region combination, we could direct our recruitment efforts working with our partners in that direction to ensure we were meeting our quotas as far as possible. So it was a very intensive fieldwork approach with this daily monitoring of data and then responsive design of the recruitment and promotion methods as a result of that. So what was used to indicate where we needed to target our recruitment efforts were our indicators, which are multivariate indicators of representativeness and um, being advocated in non-probability survey work. We did face many challenges during field work, which is always the case in any form of data collection, but particularly when you're trying out something new. And an, an issue that I'll raise here, which doesn't affect your use of the data, but I think is really important methodologically as we think about how do we collect data, is a challenge of survey fraud. And this came about for us because of this combination of an open web, web link with the voucher being provided. So anybody could get to the web link, it was widely advertised, and people who completed the survey knew that they would receive a £10 voucher. So that combination provides potential for people to complete the survey, not with a view to contributing to our valid, valid data collection, but with a view to um, financial benefit for themselves. So in March 2021, several weeks after the launch of the survey, the daily monitoring that we and the Evens team together with Ipsos were undertaking revealed a spike in survey completion uh, and completion via snowballing, which I'll come on to say a little bit about in a moment. 
And there were some aspects of these completions during this spike which caused concern for us, including clustering in certain language and ethnic groups, non-standard questionnaire timing. So it took people either longer or shorter to co complete the questionnaire and they were doing it at times of day that were uh, extraordinary given that this was supposed to be for UK, uh, for British residents. Use of fake postcode information, suspicious, suspicious open-ended responses to those questions that required write-in answers, suspicious IP addresses, and use of suspicious email addresses which participants had to provide for the receipt of the voucher. And so the, these uh, patterns in the monitoring suggested that the completes in this phase were largely coming from survey farms or from digital bots, so automated responses, meaning that we could not trust those data. Um, we made the difficult decision to pause data collection at that point so that we could instigate a number of data quality initiatives. And this is all doc documented in quite some detail in the technical report. We sent follow up emails to the, the cases we, we had identified as being suspicious and um, when it was confirmed that these were indeed not valid cases, voucher payments were not made. So we did not in the end lose money through this and we're quite confident in the quality of the data that is now available to you through the UK data service. And that's because we implemented a large number of additional quality assurance measures during that period of a couple of weeks when we paused the field work. We brought in additional digital fingerprinting. We introduced a recapture type question at the beginning of the survey to uh, mitigate the use of bots. We added in extra validation of uh, survey respondents before supplying any snowball links to them. We revised our method for daily checks and brought in additional validation checks for those daily checks on the completions. And crucially, we switched from digital provision of the vouchers to postal delivery of the vouchers. And this, we think, was really very important in ensuring that we have very high quality data because people who completed it had to have a valid um, residential address in Britain. Of course, this has implications for uh, the operation of the survey, for the resourcing and the timing, but, and that, that was certainly worthwhile in terms of improving the quality of the data. So we overcame the challenges. We prepared this questionnaire. How did we actually get people to know about the survey and to take part in events? So key to this were pr promotion and partnerships. So from the outset at the very start of the project, uh, we partnered with these organisations shown here, who are leading race equality organisations in the UK. And they represent a number of regions of the UK and in some cases, specific minority groups. So we worked with Ethnic Minorities and Youth Support Team Wales, Business in the Community, the Muslim Council of Britain, Friends, Families and Travellers, the Stuart Hall Foundation, the Runnymede Trust, the Ubele Initiative, BEMIS in Scotland, Institute for Jewish Policy Research, the Race Equality Foundation, Operation Black Vote, the NHS Race and Health Observatory and Migrants Rights Network. And all of these partners were heavily involved in designing the, the questionnaire, feeding back on the questionnaire, but mainly on publicising the questionnaire, publicising the survey to their constituencies through a large number of methods. And this meant that we had a number of routes into the EVEN survey. Uh, so the final data come through different participation starting points, if you like, which are shown in the colour boxes on the left hand side of this slide. So we had the open promotion with the voluntary and community sector partners. We had snowballing, which is when somebody completes the questionnaire. They were asked if they wanted links to the questionnaire that they could pass on to their friends and family. And we had direct activity of the community organisations, which include their email lists and regular targeting through their distribution networks and newsletters um, and other activities through media and uh, uh, radio, newspapers and so forth. 
We also made use of online panel surveys, and this was the way that we generated the general population sample or the white British sample for, for Evens. So all of the recruit that I'm talking about is for the ethnic minority part of the sample, which is just under 10,000 people in total. Different from many surveys, the advertising, the promotion around Evens was really quite crucial. Uh, this is just an example of some of the marketing materials. Um, we held events. You can see an example here with representatives from many of the partner organizations. We had large social media campaigns across multiple platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, we had on strong online presence, including on the front pages of all the partner websites. We had media uh, campaigns with TV, a partnership with Sky. We had some promotion through local community radios, including some discussion events and mini series. We had podcasts and other efforts to really raise the profile of the survey and make people aware that this was going on. And the messaging here was really very important as well in order to appeal to different groups uh, that we were trying to engage. So at the bottom left, for example, here we see one of the uh, examples of promotion that went out through friends, families and travellers trying to engage Roma and traveller communities. And you can see in the text here that there's an emphasis on confidentiality, um, that the data, the information will be fully projected, protected, responding to concerns in that community in particular. And also an emphasis here that there's a free phone telephone number. The Advert at the bottom right is an example of one that went out with Institute for Jewish Policy Research. And here you can see the emphasis is on recognising Jewish populations as an ethnic and religious minority. So there was bespoke communication uh, through the different channels. However, we still were seeing in our monitoring that some of the ethnic groups that we really wanted to engage in the survey were not participating as much as we would have liked. And this was particularly the case with the Roma and Gypsy Traveller uh, communities, which is, is not surprising. Anyone who has done research with these groups will, will know that this can be a particular challenge. And so we took quite a different approach uh, to the recruitment of the Roma and particularly the traveller communities in Evens. For the focus groups that we ran via Friends, Families and Travellers in the early months of the survey when we noticed this low participation revealed concerns amongst those communities around trust in us as academics and as data collectors. Uh, concerns about confidentiality, that the data may somehow be revealed, that their individual information might become known. Um, and there were issues of digital literacy amongst some of these communities. So in partnership with Friends, Families and Travellers, we trained six community interviewers um, and employed them to undertake face-to-face -face interviews to complete the EVENS online questionnaire. So they went out into communities and with individuals went through the questionnaire with them face-to-face -face using the online web entry to the survey. And this took place in July and August in 2021 and as part of the reason why the field work period was extended through to the autumn and we recruited 309 participants via this method giving us around 350 Roman and traveller participants in the survey overall. So this, um, this brings me to the, the end of the section that I was going to cover in terms of the collecting the data. So I, I want to pause at this point to see if there are any questions, queries that we, we might address at this point. But let me tell you about the data. What do you get? After all this recruiting and overcoming some challenges, what, what do you get from us? Um, let's think about the sample of Evens. Who is in it in the end? So the summary is we have just over 14,000 people, just under 10,000 identify as an ethnic or religious minority. And we have larger sample sizes and crucially more ethnic groups represented than any other UK social survey. So those of you familiar, for example, with Understanding Society, fantastic UK household survey, does have an ethnic and immigrant boost. Um, 
but really is, is useful for looking at broad ethnic groups with a starting sample of around a thousand for those broad ethnic groups. You can see here we have pretty high numbers for survey data for quite a lot of ethnic minority groups, um, lower for others, for example, the white Irish and the white Roma towards the bottom. I have to stress here that these are the unweighted sample sizes. So in doing analyses, you would very rarely use these numbers, might not even look at these kinds of numbers. This is the actual number of people, but when you use the data, you need to use them in such a way so that you can consider them to be representative of the population. And the adjustments we've made in the data, the weights we provide allow you to do this. And I'll come on to this in just a moment. What about breakdowns of the data in other respects? Um, these are the numbers for religious groups. So we're really successful in the partnership with Muslim Council of Britain, for example, in getting really high number of participants who identify as Muslim and pretty good participation uh, across the UK. And we're particularly pleased to have to have high numbers um, in Wales and Scotland, allowing us to compare those and other regions of England with one another. The age distribution is there. You'll, you'll notice that this is somewhat skewed, somewhat larger numbers in the younger age groups that are common finding in, um, in survey participation and something to be aware of if you're using these data. You can find lots more detail about the, the sample in the technical report and in the um, Evans book as well. Uh, this is a table from that book, which shows for each of these 21 ethnic groups that we have in Evans, the proportion that are male and female, the proportion in each age group, and the proportion in each region. And here, this is all weighted percentages, and you have the weighted number of people at the right-hand side in that final column. And you can see the weighted number for most of the groups is smaller than the actual number of people we spoke to, because of course, if we're making our sample look like the general population of Britain, then we have to add weight to, we have to multiply the um, numbers in the white British group, because in the overall population, they do account for three quarters of the population. So what did the weighting involve? This is actually quite important, and this might get a bit technical here for many of you who uh, are not particularly interested in the weights, but it is important for me to outline this because it does affect how you use the data. The main thing is you have to use the weights. But let me say a little bit about it for those of you who do have an interest in how we did this with this non-probability sample. Um, so what do the weights do? They enable you to use this data as if it were representative of the British population. This is standard. All surveys and many other kinds of data have weights in them to adjust what we have in the data so that it looks like the population overall, so that we can use it in a way that allows us to make comments about the general population. So our weights account for both coverage errors and selection bias. So Coverage error, that means if we don't get enough older people, we don't get enough people from the Northeast, we don't get enough people in the Black African ethnic group. Um, in the end, we need to adjust to make the numbers in our sample look, approximate those in the population overall in terms of those key demographic characteristics. So we did that in terms of ethnic group by, uh, by age group, sex and region. And I'll say a bit about the data we used in a, in a moment for these calibrations. For the selection bias, which is the more complex aspect of the weighting, um, what this does is says that, okay, well, some people are more interested in surveys than others. Some people are more likely to take part in this survey and some people are more likely to take part in surveys in general. And quite a lot is known about what makes people take part or want to take part in, in surveys. Less is known specifically about how this might vary across ethnic groups. But there's large literatures that tell us about this likelihood of taking part. But we wanted to adjust for this because the answers of those taking part are likely to be skewed in a certain direction. And we wanted to take account for that in the data that we publish um, and make available to you. 
So what we've used is a propensity score approach, a quasi randomization, uh, which links Evans participation to that from a reference probability sample. Don't worry at all if this is all gobbledygook to you, it doesn't prevent you from using the data. Um, so we take questions that have been asked in both the Evans data, and that was part of the design, and in reference data sets that also have ethnicity in. And we look at the responses in the two data sets and we match them up to adjust our Evans data so that we're confident that it accounts for some of this bias in who's likely to take part. And we adjusted this on the basis of people's voting eligibility, their interest in politics, their subjective general health, their participation in religious events, their religiosity, their citizenship, their trust in parliament and trust in police. So these are all aspects of people's experience and characteristics that are known uh, through prior studies to be associated with either greater or lesser likelihood of participating in surveys. So we took this information, we borrowed from this knowledge about the participants in our survey and participants in other survey to adjust for any bias there may be in terms of who did participate in EVENS in the end. So to make these adjustments, we used a number of reference data sets. We used the censuses from 2011 for England, Wales and Scotland and for England and Wales census 2021. We used the ONS annual population survey. We used the FPOP estimates from the University of Leeds and we used the European social survey. But the key message here is uh, this complicated work all leads to it's really vital to use the weights when using the EVENS data. We provide several weights in the data set, but for general use, this is the, the weight variable that we recommend that you use. And for those of you who are really interested in knowing more about the statistical approaches, about the detail of this weighting process, and indeed the representative measures and such like, there will be a follow-on session to this coming soon on non-probability survey design that will be delivered by UKDS together with Professor Natalie Shlomo from the University of Manchester, who was the statistical lead on the EVENS survey. So you've got your sample, you've got decent numbers of people across ethnic groups more than in any other survey, you've got the weights that allow you to use it as if it's representative, but what can you say? What kind of things can you talk about with EVENS? We have 679 variables covering a number of topics, um, socioeconomic and financial circumstances. What is particularly useful, I think, and interesting here is um, a lot on COVID specific circumstances and changes. So receipt of benefits, um, furlough, changes in working hours, need to homeschool, need to provide care. So very many indicators of what we might generally refer to as socioeconomic precarity in 2021. We have a whole module on ethnic and racial identity. I'll give some detail on that in a moment. We have information on housing and demographics, and this is largely, I would say, for uh, can be used as background, control, contextual information to use in combination with other variables. There's a lot on health. So those of you who are here are interested in health research, we have a wide suite of variables on both mental health conditions, uh, individual variables um, on a number of, of mental health experiences and physical health conditions and prevalence of very specific diseases and conditions. Um, Sure, Joe and Michaela can give some examples if you have some questions on that. Please put them in the Q&A. We have a, a number of questions on Black Lives Matter. What did this movement in support of anti-racism, um, what did people think about that at, at this time of heightened health and social inequalities? We ask about social cohesion and belonging, attitudes towards the police, compliance with COVID-19, initiatives and recommendations, trust and government at various different levels, and a module on racism and discrimination, which I'll come to in a moment as well. So really rich data sets with some quite unique 
variables, some that allow you to cross-reference with other data, and some that are just really useful to have in there is context and background, and quite a lot that are very specific to the COVID pandemic. And probably one of the most detailed sources of that kind of information, particularly if you're interested in this large range of ethnic groups that Evans offers. So ethnic identity, lots of you are interested in how, how we went about this. We collected information about ethnic identity in a number of ways. First of all, we asked people, we're often asked to record our ethnicity. How would you describe your ethnic background in your own words? So we have a write-in, so we have 14,200 write-in responses of how people um, consider their own ethnic identity. We also ask people to do the categorical tick boxes, which you'll uh, no doubt be familiar with from censuses and various administrative data collection using the census 2021 ethnic group categories. We asked religion in the same standard categorical way for um, people identified as Jewish. We asked about membership of synagogues. Then we asked about the, some questions about the meaning of ethnic and religious background. How important is your ethnic background or religious background to the sense of who you are? And there are a number of questions about activities relating to ethnic and religious identity. We also have country of birth of the respondent and of the respondent's parents. So there is some capability to look at migration, immigration and migrant generation with these data. And the, in the next part, I'm going to give some uh, flavours of some of the results from the data and bring some of some of these variables to life a little bit. On the racism and discrimination, this is a very large and unique set of information. We ask about different forms of racism and discrimination. Have you been insulted for reasons to do with ethnicity, race, colour or religion? Has property been damaged? Have you experienced physical attack? Have you been treated unfairly? And we ask about that one in a number of domains, in education, in your job, out in public, by friends or family, in housing in general, or in some other context. We ask if neighbours have ever made life, dif life difficult for you or your family. We ask if people worry about being harassed and um, we ask if there has been any change in unfair treatment since the outbreak of the pandemic. And for all of these questions about insult, damage, unfair treatment and physical attack, we ask people to say whether they've experienced that in the past year, the past five years, the past 10 years or over 10 years ago. So although this is a cross-sectional survey, we just collect data at one point in time, we do have the capability to have some time dimension to our description of the experiences of racism. We also asked how people responded to experiences of discrimination or unfair treatment. Did they try and do something about it? Did they accept it? Did they work harder to prove people wrong? Did they talk to someone, express anger? Did they pray about it? Really interesting set of uh, information about uh, responses to experiences of racism and discrimination. I'd like to highlight a few other variables that I think are really interesting in the EVENS data. Uh, we ask about type of accommodation. And for those of you interested in traveler communities, there are a couple of variables in there, the um, categories in their responses that you don't usually get in um, information about accommodation. And this was a result of working in partnership with friends, families and travelers that we had those questions in there. Similarly, uh, uh, through that partnership, we had questions in there about access to sanitation and water services. We ask about outdoor space, which was a, a big topic of debate during the pandemic, uh, homeworking, working arrangements, financial services, circumstances and benefit receipts, loneliness and social isolation, specific mental health conditions, specific physical health conditions, receipt of care, experiences of having the, the COVID virus, virus, household income and immigration status. So all sorts of information that you can use in, in combination with this wide range of ethnic groups to really investigate quite a lot of novel areas that we don't have a good understanding of so far.
There are some sensitive variables from EVENS, including gender identity and subnational geographical indicators, uh, which were published in terms of area classifications, such as deprivation, urbanness, and, and other aspects of local place. These are going to be made available in a further data set. These aren't in the safeguarded data set that you can now access. These will be made available um, in, in a special license data set, they have to undergo some other processes of disclosure control to ensure that it's not possible to identify individuals in these data. I think I'm going to move on now to ensure that I can show you a bit about what the data show in the time. I realise there are still some questions that I haven't um, addressed here, um, but we'll hopefully have a bit of time at the end to come back to that. But let's see a little bit about the data. What can you, what kind of things can you do with it? I'm going to present here a real snapshot of some of the findings, just indicative of what you what you can do with the Evans data. And I've taken most of these from the Evans book, which was published earlier this year. And this is free as an ebook from the evensurvey.co.uk website or from the Policy Press website. So go ahead and download that after the session and have a good flick through. Each chapter has a summary of the key points and there's lots of what I hope are quite accessible figures to illustrate the findings. So first of all, uh, I think this is a really powerful message actually. I think minorities have had a higher likelihood than the general population of having been recently bereaved, particularly in relation to COVID-19. So if you're an ethnic minority, have a higher likelihood of, of losing someone, someone very close to you dying recently, and all of the ramifications and implications of that. And that is shown by the charts on the left hand side. And let me explain these a little bit, because there are a few that look like this. So we have a dot for each of the 21 ethnic groups in the Evans survey. The further to the right that dot is, the higher the likelihood of people in that ethnic group being bereaved. The chart at the top is COVID-19 related bereavement. The chart at the bottom is bereavement of any kind. So if we take that, that chart at the top, any dot that is to the right hand side of the red line indicates a higher odds of bereavement compared to the white British population, which is indicated by that red line. And what's immediately obvious, even without looking at any detail of the numbers, is the number of those dots for the ethnic minority groups that are right of that red line, the, the number of ethnic minority groups who had a higher likelihood of being bereaved um, in 2021, or just prior to that compared to white British. I think minorities also have a higher rates of experiencing financial difficulties, and here we present it for during the pandemic, than the white British. So the same kind of chart, red line again is indicating where the figure is for the white British population. Dots to the right hand side of that white line indicate um, higher rates of financial difficulty. And you can see that this is the case for many ethnic groups, particularly for Arab towards the bottom there, also some of the mixed groups, white and black Caribbean, this is adjusted for age, those of you who might be thinking, how about is that because the, the mixed groups are particularly young, so these are age adjusted um, rates. Also the Pakistani group, higher, higher rates of experiencing financial difficulties than the white British. So you can see what's really powerful in these Evans data is the ability to talk about a whole range of ethnic groups to compare across these 21 groups. But interestingly, across Britain, ethnic minorities have higher levels of trust in UK Parliament than the white British. So we've, we've aggregated ethnic groups here, which of course you can also do. So ethnic minority people are in the green bars, white British population in the yellow bars. And we have the proportion of people who expressed um, a, a great deal or a fair amount of, of trust in UK Parliament. And this is actually management of the coronavirus pandemic. So trust in Parliament in relation to COVID-19. In all of these constituent countries of Britain, we see minorities have a higher proportion uh, who trust the UK Parliament management of the pandemic. And this is particularly evident in Wales, where minorities had this higher rate of trust than the, the overall, the general white British population. 
I found the questions on local belonging really interesting as a geographer. Um, and here we see quite clearly that people identifying as Indian, Pakistani and Bang Bangladeshi have notably strong sense of local belonging. So this is the, the likelihood, the odds of feeling a, a strong sense of local belonging. Again, to the right of the line, it indicates particularly high levels. And you can see those dots to the right of the red line for the Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi participants in evens. For Bangladeshi, approaching three times as likely had to have a, a strong sense of local belonging compared to the white British population. And on this theme of belonging again, most ethnic groups have very strong feelings of being part of British and English society. So slightly different chart here. This is the, the probability of feeling part of British and English society, British in the left hand panel and English in the right hand panel. And white British is included here. That's at the bottom row of this chart. So here we don't have this reference, this comparison to white British. This is this is um, the, the probabilities for all ethnic groups. And to point out here that it's really hard. Right? Most people, no matter what your ethnic group, feel a strong part of society, with the exception of the Roma population here. And I want to uh, present hot off the press two slides with very current research that we're undertaking in the EVENS team to try to spark your interest in some of the things and some that you might be able to do with it. Uh, and this is on, on the topic of ethnic identification. So here, what we've done is taken the responses to that writing question where, where we ask people to describe in their own words, what how do they describe their ethnic background? And we've analysed all of those uh, 14,000 responses to that question, the, the text answers to that question, in terms of, did they use standard concepts and language, as in the concepts and language used in the official um, Office for National Statistics or National Records of Scotland ethnic group classifications, or did they use some other ideas about ethnicity that aren't captured in current measurements. And we've turned these, this use of other ideas, complex articulations of ethnicity. And that's shown in the yellow segments of the bars here. So for each, each ethnic group has a bar, and then the proportion in that ethnic group that had a complex articulation of ethnicity is indicated by the yellow segment of the bar. So people who, when they ticked the box, for ethnicity ticked any other ethnic group as the category that they identified with. If they were in that category in the tick box, then half of them actually, when articulating ethnicity themselves, were using complex ideas, ideas not captured in standard data collection. And over, overall, 20% or one in five um, ethnic minorities in EVENS use a complex articulation of ethnicity. So in one way, this tells us that most people are using standard articulations. So the careful work of developing these ethnic group categories that has gone on for several decades now in statistical agencies has really paid off. Uh, most people feel pretty happy with uh, what is being collected. But there's this minority, this 20%, that actually the way they think about, talk about, articulate their ethnicity is not being captured in the, the current way that ethnic groups are categorised. How did people describe their ethnicity? These are some examples from the, the writing responses that really indicate this kind of complexity. Um, and here I've picked out ones that have a theme of place and a theme of, of cultural, uh, cultural um, affiliation as well. And born in Kenya, great great grandparents from India, brown skinned but of African origin. However, I consider myself British, a Londoner through and through, so local place is important. Cornish, not British, not English. Hungarian from Transylvania, Romani, this is an ethnic minority in Romania. I'm Turkish, but my mother is of Tatar descent and my father immigrated to Turkey from Greece, where he was part of a Turkish speaking Muslim ethnic minority. So this person who, when they do a tick box, they say I'm an other ethnicity, they have Turkish nationality, their mother has a different descent, they have immigration history um, from Greece via Turkey, 
and they're part of a religious minority. So we get here at some of the complexities of the meanings and self-identifications of ethnicity. I would describe my ethnic background as Latina. Usually I don't see any option that I feel describe my ethnic background when asked to record my ethnicity. It seems like they forget of the people from the American continent. So some really rich and interesting information there about ethnicity, ethnic identification and ethnic measurement. And I want to end the, the snapshot of results from Evans uh, with one on racism, which is one of the more unique aspects of the data set, which of course can be used in combination with health outcomes, with uh, other outcomes of social cohesion of socioeconomics, for example. This is from work that's in, in preparation. So please for this and the previous slides, um, don't cite these for the time being, they're work in progress. 80% um, of Evans participants from minoritized ethnic groups have experienced some form of racial discrimination at some point in their life. And we have that proportion displayed here across the ethnic groups. And I think this in itself really points to the need to both collect data about experiences of racism and to better understand what this means to people and to their everyday lives. Here's some examples of research areas that we have going on within the Evans and Code team. And I'd be really delighted to hear about what you are doing or think you might do with the Evans data. We're looking at life course experiences of racism across ethnic groups, connections between racism, ethnicity and loneliness, protective effects of religion for loneliness and social contact during the pandemic, social connectedness, migration and loneliness. Prevalence of common mental disorders during the COVID-19 pandemic across ethnic groups, ethnicity and local neighbourhood belonging. What does ethnicity have to do with local belonging? How is ethnic identity articulated and what can we learn from this for official ethnic group categorizations? Political trust and how this connects with COVID-19 compliance. Um, did you get a vaccine? Did you did you stay at home? Um, and methodologically, how do we produce robust non-probability survey data? So reflections on, on our methods and the success of our methods. We're gonna show you now how to access the Evans data. Then we should have a bit of time at the end for any final Q&A uh, response, but Joe and Michaela um, and I can continue to try and type away in the Q&A as Jen takes over and tells you how you can get the Evans data via the UK data service. Yeah, that's right. So I'm going to talk through um, how you might access the Evans data from the UK data service. So the data is freely available um, from the UK data service. I've got the full catalogue record here um, with it, a unique study number as well. And um, the data is available under, um, it's safeguarded data and it's available under what we call the end user license, which essentially means you need to register to access the data. For those who are very new to the UK data service, um, to sort of access this data, you need to register with an email address. Um, for UK higher education, you use your institutional username and password. For others, um, you may need to request a username um, when you go about accessing the data, but you'll be guided through this process when you do. Um, so the first part in trying to access it is to, to find the data. Um, we're going to put a link into the chat and I'll also show you how to find it in the catalogue as well. And the process of accessing it is so once you've found it in the data catalogue, you will go through to access the data. And then you uh, sort of step in terms of accessing it is you set up a project. Um, where you just add a few words to describe how you might be using the data, you allocate the data to a project and you can then download it. So if I just move over to the UK Data Service catalogue, so this is the home page and you can search for data. And luckily, as even has such a nice name, it's very easy to find it in the data catalogue. So here it is at the top. Um, study number 9116, Evidence for Equality. 
So if I click on this link, it will take me through to the catalogue page. And the catalogue page consists of a number of tabs where you can find all the information that you need. So the details tab provides a complete sort of version of all the information you might need to know about the study. Under documentation, you can access um, more information about the data. So this is where we have the user guide. We have the technical report that Nisa mentioned earlier that goes into all of the details around the data collection and processing. And we have a code book as well that you can use to explore variables in the data set. And what's important to note is that you need to register to access the data, but this documentation is freely available on the catalogue record. So you can spend time looking through this and finding um, finding out more about the study before registering. The resources tab here includes some useful things. So under publications and reports, you can find a link through to the book um, that Nisa has shown some findings from, and also a link under other to the Even the Project website. So you can find out more about the project in general. And then if you go to access data, you find the steps to follow to go through. So here it's prompting me that I need to log into my account in order to access this data. If you're registered already, you just log in. If you're not already registered and you click, this is when it will start prompting you to go through that registration process. So that's essentially everything that's involved in accessing um, the data. Just one final comment is if you do use the data, we do encourage people to, to cite the data and you can find um, all the citation details for the data on the catalogue record. And sort of citing data in this way provides a way to sort of credit the work of Nisa and her team and also helps them see how the data is being used. And finally, uh, the final slide to give you the contact details um, for me, for the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity and for the EVEN survey. If you're on social media, please do follow us. Please do sign up for the code newsletter. Uh, very glad to hear feedback. Thank you very much for your interest and engagement this morning.